Should you stop doing this? And start doing this? Well, kind of, but also not really, but, but, but sort of. Let me explain. A couple videos ago, we talked about Jeff Goldblum and how he's actually a, a really decent jazz pianist. He's a very unique style that honestly fits his personality really, really well. And uh, it's a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> I, I can't, it's just great. It's just so great. We talked about something that uh, a few of you mentioned and some, some people asked some questions about. So I thought we'd talk a little more about that and exactly what I meant when I talked about the difference between playing on autopilot versus not autopilot. So here's like the, the, the very short answer of everything. More notes does not necessarily equal better. Now, this might seem obvious, but it was something that for me as a developing musician, I really had to figure this out because I fell into the trap that I think that many young musicians fall into, especially when they're learning in the beginning. I developed some technical facility on the instrument and I wanted to use that technical facility at every waking moment. Now, of course, that started with learning the classical pieces that I thought were the flashiest and had the most notes, which of course, I equated in my head as being the hardest. But it became even more unleashed and off the rails when uh, I learned or started learning how to improvise. As you may have seen demonstrated at the beginning of this video. Now, this problem is certainly unique in some ways to piano players and just players in general that don't have the necessity of breathing, but certainly even horn players can fall victim to the desire to just play everything in your arsenal all the time as fast as you can. It's flashy, it's fun, it's impressive, and honestly, a lot of people, even listeners, enjoy it sometimes. So what changes? What along the way sort of tells us that mm, maybe that's not the way we should be playing? I think that there are a number of factors, but perhaps one of the biggest is the connection to vocal music. I mean, the vast majority of of music throughout history has contained vocals of some kind. Even before there were instruments, people were singing. And when you sing, there are certain things that come with that. You have to breathe. You might be singing words, and words have a certain rhythm, they have a certain cadence to them, there are pauses in between words. There are so many components of vocal music that require a different approach than simply just stringing notes together. And it's for this reason that our ears, particularly in Western music, but it's certainly shared across many forms of music all over the world, we are used to hearing not just a wall of notes with no breaths or no pauses. So what about when we bring this into the jazz world, into the more improvisational world? Well, we have a few different ways that we can approach playing anything. We can play a wall of notes. We can play as fast as we can and as much of a blur as we can because if it's well executed, it's definitely impressive and it can be really cool to listen to. However, there is an issue when that just kind of goes on and on and on and on. Maybe the best way to describe it would be like, we all know somebody who talks a lot but never says anything. It's just the constant motor mouth of, of, of things coming out that don't particularly have much meaning or are of much interest to anybody listening. Now, as we are developing as musicians, we are constantly taking things from all types of different influences through the process of transcription. We are always stealing things from the influences that inspire us. And through that process, we develop a vocabulary exactly the same way that, that a child learns their own native language. You're taking bits and pieces of what you hear in the world around you and you're developing your own ideas and your own ways of how to apply those bits and pieces. But as we lock many of those bits and pieces into our vocabulary, we're able to call on them almost subconsciously in many ways. There are certain technical functions that we just need to have at the ready at all times. It's one of the reasons that we practice scales and fundamentals. You're not just gonna settle at scales and arpeggios, you're, you're also gonna go into 
lines and different bits and pieces of statements or phrases that you picked up from your different influences that you want to include into your own playing. Those things are going to be readily available from your arsenal at any given time and you really don't have to think about it. Hence the term autopilot. But we have to walk this fine line of where to allow those things to surface and where to hold them back in favor of more real-time thought and actually how we're going to sing a line. I say sing because that's really, in a sense, how we're thinking about it when you try to remove the autopilot entirely. Check this out. Give this a shot and you might start to see how it actually applies to your own playing. Get yourself a backing track of something and I want you to try two things. Number one, I want you to play on your own instrument just along with the backing track like you might normally would do. Record yourself doing this so that you can go back and listen to it later. Then, once you're done with that, put your instrument down entirely. And I want you to now play the same backing track, only this time you have to sing whatever your improvisation is. So let's actually give this a shot because I want to demonstrate this. We're going to do a chorus of the tune Just Friends. The first thing I'm going to do is just play how I normally would. And then I'm going to give myself a little backing track and I'm going to probably very roughly sing along what I might improvise. And if you go back and listen to those two recordings, I know it's incredibly difficult sometimes for people to listen to themselves as it is for me. You're probably gonna notice that they're incredibly different from each other. Now, what does this mean? Well, in a sense, it means that if you were just completely organically going by what your ear is telling you at any given point in your improvisation, 
what you actually wind up playing on your instrument is not necessarily the same as that. And a lot of that is influenced by those pre-composed pieces that we've inserted into our vocabulary over a long period of time that we're able to call on almost subconsciously on a sort of autopilot. What this practice should illustrate to you is that your ear is potentially quite different from what your actual playing style is. What are we supposed to do with this information? Okay, does it mean that, oh, we should just completely discard all of the things that we've worked out over many, many years? No, of course not. This doesn't mean that there's no value or no good place where we should be using autopilot because the fact of the matter is we use autopilot all the time in so many different ways, even in our own speech with each other. We have stock phrases that we just spit out. Everybody has their own. Sometimes they're a little different from each other, but if you were actually to think very closely when somebody asked you the question, what's up? You probably wouldn't say just like, Oh, not too much, how about you? Like, you would actually think about each individual part of that question and how you feel about it and how you might actually respond to it if you were taking it that seriously. But the reality is, is that we don't do that. We just, we have these stock responses because for the sake of just making everything in a conversation go smoothly as we typically expect, we just, pull out these stock phrases that we've put into our arsenal from a long time ago. That's a lot like what we sometimes do when we're improvising. We take things that we've picked up over the years and inserted into our vocabulary and we just pull them out, sometimes somewhat subconsciously. And there is nothing wrong with that. You want ideally to have a blend of those autopilot things that we've worked out, as well as turning to much more space, much more organic thought as we're playing. It, it, you really want there to be a combination of things. Because if you listen to any of my playing, you're never gonna hear me purely playing on not on autopilot. I play on autopilot all the time. I think the goal is really just to continue to try to be thoughtful, even as we might be using autopilot phrases, so that we can maintain some organic nature and some unexpectedness even to ourselves as we are interpreting things on the go. So the argument here is not to suggest that we should not play on autopilot or that we should not play lots of notes or stock things that we've worked out. It's simply to say that over a long period of development, it perhaps yields some of the best results when we have a good mix of utilizing our instrument in ways that the human voice is not capable of, as well as utilizing our instruments in a way that feels very much to our ears like singing. One involves lots of notes, and the other involves far fewer notes. And that is why we don't make the concrete generalization that more notes does not equal better, because sometimes it might. We simply say that more notes does not always equal better. Practice leaving more space. Practice singing in your head as you're playing along. It will really help revolutionize your phrasing, your ability to feel like you're making musical statements rather than just playing lines. And that's it, that's gonna do it for me today. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate your time. Thank you to Honey for sponsoring this episode and we will see you in the next video.